So there you go. I'm John Kane, and I welcome you to Let's Talk Native on this uh, well, Saturday, <laughs> April 20. 5th, 2020. While this program may not provide a path to spiritual enlightenment, we do encourage and in some cases start conversations. We kind of break the rules here for Native Radio. We don't do prayers or buffalo speeches or get all mystic. Uh, We take a tough look at history, oppression, and survival. We talk about culture, the arts, politics, and identity. And we may step on a few toes along the way. But our real goal here is to bring people together by breaking down what separates us. We'll take on the false narratives and provide critical thinking to all that is heaped upon us, and we do it all right here from the Cattaraugus Territory of the Seneca Nation. So let's talk Native. But first, let me remind people that our audio streams on our website, which is www.letstalknative.com, our video streams live on Facebook, uh, via Facebook Live on our group pages and share it up across a bunch of other group pages. We take the audio and we put it up on SoundCloud, which puts it up on uh, all your f- favorite podcast platforms. And we take the video and we put it up on our YouTube channel, which is Let's Talk Native TV. I encourage you to subscribe to the podcast and subscribe to our YouTube channel. That way you'll catch the videos that we do that are not just these shows, but uh, our, our short form videos as well. Uh, I am the show's host and producer, and I'm joined here in studio by Jake Proud, who is managing our video and our uh, and our sound. Um, well, let me let me run through some some basic COVID numbers. Uh, you know, I know that you get these other places, but I try to keep it simple so people can. Um, you know, keep track a little bit. You know, we do a show on Tuesday. We do one on Saturday. So beginning of the week, end of the week. Uh, by tomorrow, the world will have reached 3 million uh, confirmed by test cases of COVID-19. So they're at uh, 2 million, uh, 900,000 and 20, uh, 920,000. So, and they're adding, you know, between 80 and 90 new cases a day, uh, 90,000, I'm sorry, 80 and 90,000 new cases a day. So by tomorrow, um, the, the global numbers will have reached, uh, 3 million. Uh, the death count, um, globally, um, has, uh, um, surpassed 200,000 today. Um, it's at, it's about 200,000 or 203,000 people have died from COVID-19. And that was a mark that was, uh, you know, again, 200,000 was surpassed today. On the United States level, um, they the number is about 960,000 confirmed by test cases, and that uh, a million will be reached by Monday. By Monday, the United States will cross over that million threshold of uh, of, of cases, not act. You know, uh, both total cases, including uh, active cases, uh, those who have died and, and those who have recovered. Um, the uh, new cases for today, uh, 35,000 new cases today. Now, that's the second highest number of new cases in a single day. For, uh, and so people are still talking about apex and peak, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, it was only like three or four days. Actually, I'm sorry, it was just yesterday um, was the highest single. It was almost 39,000 for a single day. That was just yesterday. So anybody who who is really buying into this notion that our, we've reached the, the peak and uh, smooth sailing from here, um, no, no, that's that's not what the numbers are indicating. And, and again, these are only numbers, for, for the most part, confirmed by, by actual COVID-19 tests. Um, the, the deaths for today, uh, or for the United States, reached uh, 54,000 today. Um, that means... By Tuesday evening, the United States, because they're adding about 2,000 deaths a day, by Tuesday evening, the United States will have reached the 60,000 um, persons mark. Now, if in case you, you don't recall, 60,000 is was the total number of deaths that the, the, Trump's COVID task force was, was calling for. Not initially, and this is a, and this is one of the things problems that I really have, and where my credit, the credibility that I have towards Fauci and Burks, um, has really been been compromised. And and the reason I say that is, initially the they claimed the the models and all that other stuff were suggesting that there would be between one hundred and two hundred thousand um, deaths, and that's a pretty big. <laughs> range 102,000. That I mean, that's not doesn't really narrow it down much. But then, just two weeks ago, 
I, I heard Fauci and others, you know, with, uh, on the Trump task force say, well, we're downgrading that. We're, we don't think we're going to reach 100,000. We think we're going we're gonna to max out at 60. Well, that's going to happen Tuesday. I'm pretty sure that on Tuesday, the death count doesn't stop. So I don't know what those guys were looking at. I mean, because I'm looking at the same numbers. I'm looking at the numbers they're producing. And I'm saying there's no way this thing's going to just stop at 60,000. Like I said, 60,000 should be reached on Tuesday. 54,000 right now. Uh, so, I mean, that's, you know, and, and, and Trump actually tried to pad that a little bit. He said, well, we think between 60 and 65,000. Well, okay. That'll take about two more days to get to. So by Thursday, it'll be 65,000. So, you know, and, and that may, that could happen even sooner because, you know, the, the problem is that the new cases are still rising, even in the United States. Like I said, yesterday was the highest single day for, for new cases. Today was the second highest. That doesn't translate into deaths uh, um, until, you know, four or five days later. So there's a lag behind the number of new cases and the, and the number of deaths. So, um, so that, that's what the numbers look like. Well, let me, let me add in there. Uh, one of the numbers that that's I find you know increasingly disturbing, which is the number for the, for the uh, the Navajo Nation, and they have reached uh, fifteen hundred and forty cases, which is a really high number for that distinct population. Uh, Fifty eight deaths, um, really disturbing, you know. And and again, um, one of the subjects I'm going to talk about here is what's you know the topic is what's really killing us and and I'll, i'm going to explain that a little bit because i don't want to i'm not suggesting that COVID 19 isn't but i want to talk about what that what that really means but when i look at something like navajo where you know a third of the people don't even have running water and and this isn't a failure you know anybody who says it's a failure of socialism no it isn't this isn't about socialism the poverty and stuff that exists on native territory is not a failure of socialism. It's a failure of, uh, of imperialism. It's a failure of colonialism. And it's a failure of capitalism. That's what that is. So when anytime I hear somebody say, well, you want to see failed socialism, just look on any Indian reservation. Bullshit. I'm just, I'm just it's it just, that's just bullshit. So when, when I think about the, the lack of resources that exist on native territories, the poverty that exists on native territories, that wasn't, that poverty isn't, isn't because of socialism. And it certainly isn't because millions of dollars are dumping in, you know, to, to solve the, the poverty problem. And you can't just always throw money at things anyway, but that's not what's happening anyway. Look, there's a lot of money that goes into the Bureau of Indian Affairs, but by the time it trickles down, it's been swallowed up bureaucratically before it ever gets gets to the ground. So again, um, I'm really disturbed by what what happens on native territories. Here in, in the Seneca territory, we we actually experienced the first loss of life uh, associated with a, with a COVID nineteen uh, case. And uh, my you know my thoughts and my heart goes out to the family who was who was mourning the loss of their loved one. Um, I think there were only three confirmed cases, um, two in Allegheny and one in here in Cattaraugus. And, uh, and you know, and and the other two uh, never had severe symptoms from what I understand. And, and I could have some of this wrong. I mean, uh, you, the, the information is somewhat limited and, and I'm all sharing to the best of my knowledge what's what's taken place. But I do know that there was uh, one loss and um, you know, so it does still hit ho close to home. And, you know, and it's it's in the area, it's in the region, and it's it's all around us. Um, so anyway, I want to mention that. Look, I also want to, before I get into, into the main thrust of what I'm going to talk about today, I do want to thank again Kat Carnes for joining me on my show that we do here in studio for, for my New York show um, on WBAI. Uh, for those of you who missed that, I encourage you to go check out uh, Thursday's show, uh, my Let's Talk show on W. Uh, for for, uh, for WBAI, Cat Carnes um, um, has been married f to my friend Ben Carnes, and both Cat and Ben um, I consider friends. Uh, ben lost a uh, a long and ugly battle with uh, with with cancer back in January, and really in in the wake of uh, of that loss. Um, Kat used her nursing degree and uh, and her credentials to 
to participate in, uh, continue to participate in the traveling nurse program, and and took her skill set to New York, and she she joined me from from New York, from Brooklyn, um, where she described some of what uh, what she's experiencing as a frontline uh, nurse at a, uh, at a at a pretty good hospital, a hospital that's well equipped in uh, in Brooklyn, and and you know, and she you know was very upfront and very you know candid about you know, what she's experiencing and you know one of the things that she said you know, that you know, sounded almost too matter of fact she said the majority of the people that she's treating aren't going to make it and 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 although you know many of us have a sense for that you know what what's really at play especially in new york is is the people who go into the hospital who require hospitalization are in pretty rough shape I mean, you know, Andrew Cuomo, and and he's mentioned this multiple times on on his uh, his his briefings on on COVID his COVID briefings, that if you get put on a ventilator, there's only a twenty percent chance you're ever coming off of that alive, and so eighty percent of the people who go on a ventilator, I mean, these are people who, who who've been put under, and that you know they're put under anesthesia, they're they're knocked out, they're not conscious, they have a tube put down their throat, and it, and it pumps air into their lungs. And, and, and again, Kat made it very clear. She said, our only job here is to keep people alive. They don't treat the virus. I mean, they, they treat the body. They try to keep people alive because it's the body that has to fight off the disease. You know, and, and that's the case with, you know, with, a, with most infectious diseases, whether they're bacterial, fungal, or, or, or viral. Um, but there isn't a lot of great antiviral medications. There's, there's, you know, look, there's antibiotics and there's antifungal medications that, that can help. But most of those, all they can do is, is, is help the body fight these things off. And, you know, and, and in the case of viruses, we're, you know, very much at the, at the mercy of, of a person's own immune system being able to be in a position to, to, to overcome and, and to conquer the effects of, uh, of, a, of a viral infection. So, uh, again, I want to thank Kat, uh, not only for joining me on the show, I want to just thank her for the, for, the, for the work that she does. And, you know, somebody who, who has been, had her own struggles and um, she traveled from Oklahoma to go to New York. And I, and I just want to you know, give props to, to Kat Carnes for joining me and for the work that she's doing uh, in, in New York. So, all right. So the question that I that I posed is, what's really killing us? And 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 I don't want this to sound like I'm trying to start a, a conspiracy theory here. I'm not. I'm I'm. What I'm trying to point to is the um, the impact of underlying conditions. You know, I heard um, a, a doctor on television. Actually, it was on Bill Maher's show, um, and he, and he talked about the fact that that. Many of us engage in, in a behavior that is not a healthy lifestyle. And, and we can do it because even if we do things, we put on weight, you know, we, we eat, we consume too much sugar, we, we smoke, we drink, we, you know, we, we, we do a little of this, we do a little of that, you know. And we, we don't necessarily think we're, we're you know, bulletproof and invisible or, you know, or, you know, or t totally, uh, you know, invulnerable, we just think that's going to affect us later on. We, we know the, the, the long-term effects of, of that behavior are bad, but the short-term are, feels pretty good in the short time, you know, look, that cake looks great. You know, that, you know, I could, I could drink a couple more Budweiser's. I can, you know, I can smoke, uh, smoke a pack a day. You know, I can, you know, I can, you know, you know, live, an unhealthy lifestyle because I can always compensate for it later. You know, so that's kind of, you know, that's kind of thing. Now I'm not suggesting, and, and don't get me wrong. I'm not suggesting that everybody who has an underlying condition have that underlying condition because they did it to themselves. I'm not even going there. I'm not, I'm, that's not what I'm saying, but I'm saying to the extent that we can improve our health. If there's one thing that COVID-19 should be telling us and, and, and showing us is the stronger we are going in to, you know, to, to face the things that we face every day, you know, even you know, again, even some of the, uh, the occasional um, poor lifestyle choices, if we generally try to take care of our health, 
we will be able to overcome that stuff. So we can overcome not only COVID-19, but we can overcome the seasonal flu. We can overcome, you know, the, you know, whatever viral, fungal, or bacterial infection, you know, is whatever the next pandemic is. If we reduce the number of people who have underlying conditions, then we obviously reduce, to some extent, the, the mortality of that, uh, uh, of, of the disease. I mean, I look at, you know, at, the handling of the the pandemic thus far. And I'm not criticizing the, the notion of flattening the curve, but I'm still not understanding what the end game is. I, I'm still not understanding how do we get to a place where, and when do we get to a place that we say, okay, it's, it's fine to, to behave the way we did before, uh, you, know, be, you know, before February. And I'm not saying the way we behaved before February was, was good. I'm not saying the normal, I think the old normal sucked. I don't consider this the new normal, but what is going to be the new normal? I mean, that, that's part of my question. And if the new normal ends up being, look, I'm going to be ready the next time. You know, so you know, I, I'm, I'm going to lose a few pounds. I'm going to you know, stop smoking. I'm going to, you know, or, or and look, maybe you don't stop smoking. Maybe you smoke less. Maybe you smoke a pack a week instead of a pack a day. Maybe you have a beer, you know, after dinner. You don't drink a six pack after dinner every single day. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I mean, everything is about you know, in moderation, right? I mean, there are things that you can do that are not necessarily good for you. And, and look, I, I know a lot of people who smoke weed and, and they, and they get a value out of it. And, and look, that's one way that you can, you can use uh, marijuana, cannabis, whatever to a, a therapeutically. And and some people prefer that method rather than eating gummy bears or whatever whatever the, the 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 means of ingestion are. But that's not chain smoking, yeah. And so you're not necessarily compromising your lungs in the way that a guy. Uh, I mean, I wonder a person who smokes a pack a day. What is that equivalent to in terms of breathing? You know, bad air. I I, I don't know. I mean, I'm I'm just throwing that out as a question, but. You may not be able to control where you live. You know, you may live in a place that is that is a you know a, a hot spot for for cancer or for you know asthma or be, you know be, and maybe you can't control where you live because of you know your your financial situation. And and it's just not enough to say well everybody should just improve their you know their affluence and uh, and 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 move to a healthier a healthier location. No. That's again part of the the effects of not only capitalism but colonialism, imperialism, holdover from slavery, and all kinds of other oppressive practices that the United States has built its economy on. But to but to the extent that we can control some things, look, I get it. You know, ramen noodles cost you know fifty cents or something like that. I mean, and you can you you can solve you know a, a hunger craving with with a pack of ramen noodles. But if, if you're eating that every single day, not just on the occasion, you know what? I feel like having ramen noodles today. But if, if that's what you're living on and if that's what you're feeding your children on, and I'm not condemning you because you're, you're, your financial situation may be limited. But when we want to talk about societal changes, see, this isn't just about personal choice. This is about what we're going to do to establish the new normal after this. I mean, I, I think about what we, uh, diabetes and, and how prevalent it is on, on our territories, heart disease. How, I mean, how many people are on dialysis? You know, so, and, and what contributes to the kidney failures? Yeah, I'll tell you, there's a whole bunch of things that contribute to kidney failures. And they aren't just the simple, basic uh, lifestyle choices. It isn't just drinking. It isn't just this. It isn't just that. You know, sometimes it's the medications. We have the, the, the amount of depression and mental health issues that uh, that our people face, which again, these are not lifestyle choices that cause these things, but the medications that that people take for uh, for, for mental health are oftentimes terrible on your kidneys. So we have kidney high kidney failure, we have heart disease, we have diabetes, we have depression, we have asthma, COPD, um, we we have you know a, a higher incidence of, of cancer, some somewhat caused by by. Some may be caused by personal lifestyle things like like smoking and drinking and that kind of thing, but a lot of it is environmental because of the environment that has been imposed upon us, because of the environmental degradation. 
we we do not eat the most nutritious diet and we're a people who who had that right and but that over time fr fry bread's not a, not a traditional food <laughs> It, it's become a traditional food. Fry, fry bread is is the result of the United States dumping sacks of crappy flour and uh, and 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 lard on us. I mean, we had cornbread, not not fry bread. But this is this is what we now now we take a piece of fry bread and we put a bunch of ground beef on it and and cheese and uh, and and we call it an Indian taco. And I got to tell you, I love Indian tacos. <laughs> I'm going to tell you. But I don't want to live on I'm not going to eat that three or four times a week. You know, so there are some lifestyle choices that we have to make. And I think when we, when we look at the role that underlying conditions is playing, especially with, with COVID-19. See, here's what COVID-19 is doing. It's taking away the luxury of time. It's not, it's, it's, it is making those folks now have to answer for their underlying condition, not sometime down the road, but immediately. So if you get COVID-19 now, while you have a pre-existing condition or an underlying, you know, condition, you are at a much greater risk, a much greater risk. So what could be, what could have been done? <clears throat> Look, and I, I'm not suggesting that all of these underlying conditions, and in fact, I'm not even suggesting the majority of these underlying conditions are caused by, by lifestyle choices. Because some of these things we don't have a choice in. Where we live, you know, our, our access to, to good quality food, sometimes that, that choice has been taken away from us. But my, the point that I'm trying to make is how do we how do we avail better choices to ourselves? How do we not only make better lifestyle choices, but how do we make, we, we broaden what those choices are? I mean, it's fine to have all kinds of multi-million dollar programs on native territories. And, and it's fine to be, to be uh, one of the more affluent native territories. And the Seneca Nation is one of them. But I know that it's a fight every freaking year to keep their, their relatively modest um, agriculture project going. That should be a major emphasis of what the Seneca Nation is doing. Being, I mean, getting more and more people involved, not just in a nation program, but perhaps a, you know, the nation provides more to the people. And I, I know there's a lot more effort out there. People are offering to till and, and do some of the things to help you know, um, do ground prep so people can have gardens of their own. I mean, when I was a kid, all of uh, all of our families had gardens, and and I've mentioned this before, and and gardens is just a part of it. I mean, but we we should do more of that. But there's other things that we should do to make sure. Look, if I start telling people you need to eat Brussels sprouts, <laughs> people are gonna look at me like I got five heads. I, and the idea of trying to tell people how they should live, but you know what? We have another generation. We always have another generation that we can influence positively. So regardless of what, what we think our desires are or what, what we're drawn to, we should work extra hard to make sure the next generation does better than we did in terms of um, lifestyle choices. And obviously, our, we lead by example or we lose by example, depending on what we want to do. But, you know, you want to look at programs whether they're community programs or nation programs or family programs, whatever, these are the kinds of things that we have, we've, we've got to see, think, think clearly about and make some conscious decisions. We should not accept the old normal or want to return to that old normal. The old normal sucked. I mean, and this isn't the new normal. This is, we're at a place right now that we don't know what it's going to look like on the other side yet. And why? Because we don't even know how long the, the shutdown stuff is going to be, how long, you know, is the, is, is the, con the economy that has never been kind to most of us, but we, we've grown accustomed to it because it's amazing what you can get used to. But this is <clears throat> where we're at right now leaves us questioning where we're going to be in six months. So what, how do we use this time? And, and what should be our mindset? What, what should we be thinking about as we're envisioning ourselves post-COVID-19? Well, we, we better be, be not be thinking about going back to where we were before COVID-19. Otherwise, nothing changes.
I mean, something has changed. But if you go back to, uh, you know, to the, the old normal and don't recognize that the old normal sucked, then we're just destined to repeat this all over again. All right, we're at the bottom of the hour, so we'll, we'll take a break. We we'll go back. I want to I want to talk more about this because I think think there's also a lot of confusion about what reaching the the apex or the peak or the top of the curve means. And I'm, I'm going to talk about that when we come back. This is John Kane, and this is Let's Talk Native. All right, thanks for coming back. This is John Kane. This is Let's Talk Native. And I want to thank our sponsors. I want to thank Ross and Holly John and the RJE family of businesses. I want to thank the folks at uh, Grenver Enterprises and uh, Native Wholesale Supply, um, uh, Eric White and the RW Enterprises, and uh, the folks at Cat Res Smoking Gas. Um, and I, look, I want to thank all of you who, who, who have contributed. Uh, you know, again, VG and Steve come to mind. Any of these guys who who, you know, on occasion send a, send a check or, uh, you know, or, uh, you know, uh, Cynthia, different ones who, who help out from time to time. I do, I really do appreciate it. And it does help us because <clears throat> look, every day we're trying to improve what we do here. And some of the things are about equipment purchases. Some of them are about buying services. Uh, I'm trying um, a few other services to connect up to, to WBAI that work better than Skype, for instance. So you know, I'm, I'm not real happy with the, uh, with the quality of the, the connect connectivity that I have with, uh, with WBAI. So, <clears throat> so you buy a couple of uh, different, you know, apps and you, and you try different things and, you know, and, and it's the support that I get from, you know, a few businesses, a few listeners that, uh, that enable me to, uh, you know, some of the stuff doesn't work out. I mean, I, look, I've, I've got some, some things in here, <laughs> including my, my internet feed, which is still inadequate, but, uh, you do the best you can with what you got. So, um, but in the circumstance, uh, circumstance that we're in, we've got to try a lot of things. We don't have easy solutions, and it's you know it gets back to some of the 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 challenges that that we face as native people. You know, some of the challenges we face come from you know lack of infrastructure. The, the uh, again, what exists on native territory, um, uh, the circumstances here are policy driven. There's a reason we don't have reliable internet here. There's a really reason we don't have, you know, high quality water in many native territories. If if we have running water at all, I mean, there, there's a reason for all that stuff, and, uh, and 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 it's policy driven. And you know, when we tr do try to lift ourselves out and we establish an e economies, even if they're economies that are not based on the on the healthiest lifestyles, like tobacco, for instance. You know, I'm not so much worried about the. Uh, uh, fuel is what it is. Environmentally, it's it's, it's challenging, but we car try to carve out an economy on what the mainstream, you know, uh, you know, commerce is based on, and we find ourselves in a battle with New York State or the federal government. We we carve out a spot in gaming, and we we get fleeced for you know a billion dollars from the state of New York. So these are the challenges that we face, even as we try to figure out how to overcome the 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 U.S. and state policies that have left us in the you know, behind on uh, on on some of the basic needs that we have. So anyway, um, look, I want to talk a, a little bit about the um, the flattening of the curve. You know, Jake and I were talking before the show. There's this there's this false notion that there's that they're they're not thinking about this as a curve, or if they are, they're thinking about it as a curve with a point on the top of it. You know, or they're thinking about, you know, reaching the apex as this as this pinnacle of this is the day we had the the most deaths or the most cases and everything down. And now we're going down the other side of that hill. But that's not the way this isn't a, this isn't a pyramid. This is a trapezoid. This isn't a, a mountain. It's a it's a plateau. You get to a place where. Yeah, you're gonna have some days that the that the you know the numbers on on the websites drop down, but then they're followed by by a day after that that they go back up. There, there's for the last 15 days, there's been an average of 2,000 deaths a day in uh, in in the United States. 2,000 deaths a day. Look, there's been some days that were below that, but and then there's been some days that were significantly higher than that. And actually, I take it back. The average has been over 2,000 uh, a day. You know, like I said, yesterday was the highest daily total for new cases. 
And and of course, this all can change. You know, regions are not all hitting the same at the same time. So so when you hear Cuomo talk about an apex, or when you hear people talk about, you know, um, somehow getting on the other side of this thing, or, or that you know, you know that the the hospital admissions are coming down, or this is coming down, or that's coming down. No, it really isn't. It's leveling off. The I've said this before. The idea of flattening the curve, it, it said flatten. It didn't say just lower the you know the the apex. It, it is lower, but it, it flattens it, and and it also essentially fattens it, the curve. So, and what I mean by that is, when you look at those curves that they posted up, the the curve that 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 um, represents if if we did nothing was a pretty a curve with a pretty high peak. And and then it went up, and then it came down relatively quickly. It still wasn't a point, by the way, but it uh, but it, it is a curve, flattening. And then it came down, and then and in all that area under that curve, that's the total number of people who are infected, because the the um, the y axis I think is the number of cases, and the x axis is the is the number of days. So that area under the curve is the total number of people who are um, who who become infected. And the reason for flattening the curve was to keep their, uh, the hospitals, to try to keep the number of infected people below the capabilities of uh, the hospitals had in treating them. So flattening the curve meant that you slowed the spread. You didn't stop the spread. You slowed the spread so the number of people who were being infected on a daily basis would be low enough that they could still get, get medical treatment. So what that means is, yeah, you flattened the, you, you, you didn't just wipe out the top of the curve. You flattened it and then you broadened the base. So, it, so it, the spread was going to go slower. It wasn't going to be less. It was just going to be slower. Again, the number of people underneath the flattened curve are, is the same number of infected people as the people under the, the unflattened curve. If, if you don't understand what I mean, then you, you just got to look up the curves, look at the curves online and you can see, maybe I can get Jake to post the uh, a, a picture. And we still, we still got a picture of the curve. You can throw it up there so people can see it behind me. And, and maybe, then maybe you'll, you'll have, again, a better understanding of, of what I'm talking about. But the flattening of the curve means that you don't reach an apex and then immediately drop back down. It means that you stay at that level. So, it, you know, I, I liken this to a flood. Look, when the, when the floods come, you know, again, we got the curve here. So if you notice uh, the, the blue curve, it doesn't come down immediately. It stays at a, you know, it stays at, a, at its higher, its higher point is lower than, than the red curve, okay? But, but it stays at a higher point for a longer time. And then it extends the number of days that, that infections are spreading. The areas underneath those two curves are the same. The whole idea was to stay below the, the dotted line that, that, uh, that's on the curve, which is hospital capability. So I, I just I just want people to, to kind of understand that, but if you think that you, you you're you've dropped down below that curve immediately, that's simply not the case. That it, it takes a it takes a significant amount of time to where you can say, um, all right, it's we're we've got this thing beat. And I you know, the problem that I have with this whole process is is I don't know what the end game is. I don't know. When where on that curve, either one of them, I mean, do you get to a place where you can return to way to where you were before the curve started? And I don't know that that's what we want to do. But um, I, again, I, I I I listen to all the stuff on the news, and I and I listen to some of the media, um, the you know the media events, whether it's Cuomo's or Trump's, and and some are funnier than others, and some of them aren't funny at all. But um, I, I, I listen to them and and I get really concerned about some of the things that I hear said. And, and it isn't even so much what is said, but I'm afraid what is being said is not what's being heard. And, and I'm not you know trying to change somebody's words, but when people say we've reached the apex, the, the immediate you know, uh, thing that I think people see is, okay, we've reached the apex, now, now it's gonna go down. Well, not necessarily. Not necessarily. This is a plateau. It's not a mountain. We're at a place where every day it's it's anybody's guess whether you're going to have a drop or you're going to have a rise, you know, and you may have a drop and then the next day have another rise in the, in the either the, the death count or the new case count. 
we're not there yet. And, you know, and frankly, until either the all the people who are going to get in, get infected get infected uh, or they develop a vaccine and everybody decides to take it, which I'm not sure that everybody will. I don't know when we're on the other side of this thing. And if the game plan was to just shut down for a couple of weeks or a month, then it was a bad game plan. And if, if anybody thought that shutting down meant you were going to shut down for, uh, didn't realize that you're going to have to shut down for, for three, four, five, maybe six months, then you're just not understanding the, the, the nature of, of any of this, I guess. And, and, you know, I realized that people had to spend a month at home with their families and apparently that got everybody antsy. And, and you know, look, there's massage parlors opened up now in, in, in Georgia. I'm not suggesting that you go to Georgia to get a massage or anything, but I mean, this is what, this is what's happening there. You know, barber shops are opening up and hair salons and nail salons and tattoo parlors are opening up in, in, in various places. I pick it on Georgia because this guy just you know, carte blanche open, you know, decide that all these things could be open. Now, granted, you're probably going to be, you know, tattooed by somebody who's wearing a mask, but you know, most of the responsible tattoo artists were wearing masks already. Um, and nail salons, they were wearing masks too. Why? Because they don't want to breathe in the nail dust. <laughs> But it, 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 the, it, you still have a, a, a significant amount of personal contact, and that's going to be you know, that's going to cause uh, an increase in the spread. You watch every one of these places that that's release, uh, that's loosened up restrictions are going to have a jump in their numbers. So every state, every region that has uh, that has relaxed the regulations are, are and you're already seeing it. Actually, you're already already seeing it in a lot of places. So this is not over by a long shot. But, you know, it, it gets me back to what I was speaking about originally. Our best defense on this thing is what we can do personally to improve our health. And, and then, you know, when I, I think about this from a Native standpoint, I hope that this sends a strong signal to, to, to the Seneca Nation or any other Native governing system or whatever else that we need to have a much stronger um, – policy and and support for changing lifestyles you know it's, it's not enough that we have a clinic that that it you know that it, you know has a great pharmacy and uh, and it can issue all of the the meds that people need it's it's necessary to do that and I'm, and I'm not criticizing that but that we need to we need to do some things that that improve health not just treat illness because if you're ill already you're you you've got you've got an underlying condition so what can we do what can we begin to do that's going to improve health well and it's like anything else I, i've talked about this when it came to it comes to things like drug abuse for instance look we have people who are addicted to uh to, to various behaviors whether it's you know um heroin whether it's you know cocaine uh whether it's alcohol or whether it's tobacco we, we have people who are addicted, but we have people who aren't addicted yet that maybe are on the precipice of that. I say the same thing about any other, any other behavior that could compromise health. We have people who, who are ill and those people need to be treated and they need treatment and whatever that treatment is and whatever that illness is. But we should be doing as much as we can to prevent new cases. Because that is going to be the next, the best way to, um, you know, to, to fight off the next pandemic. The people who are the most vulnerable today are the ones with, with underlying conditions. And now I'm not suggesting, and let, and let me be clear here, this disease is deadly. And, and although it, it is demonstrated the, the most deadly consequences of those people with underlying conditions, there are people who, who didn't have underlying conditions who have died. And, uh, and, and obviously these people need, need, you know, whatever the best treatment available or, or they need to be kept alive for as long as possible so their bodies can overcome these. But some aren't going to overcome it no matter what. Children seem to um, not have adverse effects. You know, their, their, their mortality rate is very, very, very low. But that doesn't mean some children haven't died. And I don't mean just infants. And, and you know, infants are still at risk. Mothers don't don't seem to, you know um, uh, who are pregnant or women who are pregnant don't seem to be at risk, 
um, any more than anybody else. But you're talking about one body with two lives, so so that's why those are considered people that you want to you know, give extra attention to. And you and the baby, as an infant, is is very vulnerable. So we need to we need to do everything possible to protect the most vulnerable people. But also, let's I'm, I'm, I'm not telling people not to get pregnant. <laughs> I mean, pregnancy is something we need. We need pregnancy to propagate the you know our, our populations. So I'm not I'm not decrying being pregnant. But the other things that we do that are healthy or that are that, that are risky lifestyles. We should do everything we can. And you know what? And, and again, I put it back on policymakers, on people who, who have, you know, um, more influence to change. And it's not even just government. Look, there, there's some wealthy business people and, um, you know, there, there, are, there are other organizations that, that people can rely on. I'm not just talking about state and federal funding or anything else. But whatever we need to do to begin to change, to shift, so our new normal isn't the old normal. I mean, and if it's going to be the old normal, let it be the re the real old normal. Back when we 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 did raise more of our food, and we were more independent, I mean, there was more food sovereignty, as they say. But we also have to turn back, you know, some other thoughts about what we what we have ac accepted as our identity, like like fry bread. I mean, and I'm not I hate to just pick on one piece of food here, but but there's a lot of things that we have to consider. <sighs> that could change the way we live going forward. And look, we're a population that can do it. I realize that there, I mean, you're not going to change 10 million people in the, in the New York city metropolitan area, at least not overnight, but we haven't done a great job, you know, fulfilling, you know, our own responsibility to ourselves and to our future generations and that kind of thing. So that's, I mean, that's what I wanted to talk about today. You know, when I said, what's really killing us, Look, even in the absence of COVID-19, we don't we we have a pretty low uh, life expectancy because of some of these underlying conditions that we've that that have become so prevalent in our in our territories. Again, kidney disease, you know, liver disease, heart disease, diabetes, you know, arthritis. I mean, some of the things that that are that plague our plague our people are incredible. And of course, you know, our lifestyle choices. You know, alcohol has been a major um contributing factor to 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 um to you know to diminished health um you know, and, and alcohol is probably worse than tobacco and and we, and we know tobacco is not good for you so we need to do more we need to do all that we can do to you know to not only change our the lifestyles of those of us who are are living it now but try to keep the next generation those those kids from from who are, who, are on that, who are on that precipice of making, you know, bad lifestyle choices. I mean, it's, it's easy to say, let, let's stop those you know, youngsters be, uh, uh, from being, you know, drug abusers. But I know too many parents who, are, who, who literally say they can't wait to drink, drink with their kids. You know, or smoke, you know, smoke weed with their kids. You know, look, I, I think there, there are some things that we do in moderation, including drinking and smoking, you know, and, and smoking, whatever, that I think in moderation probably have, you know, some benefit to it. But, but again, there's a, there's a question of moderation and I'm not encouraging people to drink with their kids or smoke, smoke up with their kids. I'm not. I think if you're, you're in a situation where you have to make some choices about what you're going to use to treat you know, whether it's a mental health issue or, you know, or anything else, then in a perfect world, you wouldn't need anything, right? But that's not the world that we live in. And that's not the world that, that was created, you know, by imperialism and colonialism. It, that was you know, the world that we live in right now is still reeling from the effects of genocide, so I think we have to do everything we can to no longer be the victims. But we have to do more to say, no, we are going to control our destiny more. We're not just going to make do with, 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 with what we have. 
we're going to we're going to ask and we're going to we're going to fight for more. <clears throat> and I don't mean about taking things from people. I'm just saying we're going to fight to improve our lives. And I don't mean just financially, but but that too. But these are the conversations that we need to have. How do we in, in, improve the quality of our lives? Because I'm not saying that it, that it's based on, you know, our, our income tax return. But we do have to think, we have to seriously consider and seriously think about what that improvement's going to be. And, and what, and when we talk about happiness or we talk about, um, you know, living, you know, a, a, you know, a life of fulfillment, I'm, maybe we need to rethink what that, what, what that means in general. And hopefully, and hopefully we can, we can make some choices that improve the quality of our life by our own measure, not by the measure of somebody else, not by, you know, I don't know, not, not, not by how many cars we have or how much money we have. And if we, if we prioritize different, then we can also, you know, change the quality of our health along with the quality of our lives. You know, uh, like I said, as I look at what we what we're seeing with COVID nineteen, there's no question that we need to um, be uh, very protective of the most vulnerable people, and that inclu obviously includes our elders. You know, having reached sixty years old, I don't feel like I'm one of those people who has to be protected. <laughs> but I, you know, I know there's there are people my age who who are, um, you know, who are not in as good health as I am. And look, I'm I'm clearly carrying more weight than I should and that kind of stuff. But so I'm not I'm not in perfect health. But um, but I, I think we have to do all that we can to protect the most vulnerable people. And and one of the best ways to protect the most vulnerable people is not let more of our people become those vulnerable people. You know, like I said, COVID nineteen has brought the long term effects of our behavior closer to us. Because if you get sick with COVID-19 today, you may not make it a week because of the underlying conditions. Those underlying conditions that you could have lived with for years, you could have continued to smoke, you could have continued to drink, you could have continued to, you know, uh, to do so many of the things. You could have continued to, you know, to, to not pay attention to what the quality of the food that you could have done that for your, for, for years. But COVID nineteen brought it to you and said, "No, now you're 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 going to pay for for that underlying condition today, or within the next five days." So, for those of us who get through the other side of this, and the vast majority of us will, this should be a, a bit of a cautionary tale. This should be a lesson that says, "Look, we need to do all that we can." all that we can to make sure that the, the next wave of COVID-19 or the, the, or the next global pandemic or look, the next seasonal infectious disease that comes through, that we are not among the vulnerable population. We need to protect that population, but we got to do everything we can to stop adding to it. We should, we should make do everything we can. We should make sure and do everything we can to ensure that the, the vast majority of our people are as healthy as our circumstance will allow. I don't think we're doing that right now. I, I think we could do more. I think the Seneca Nation could do more. I think every, you know, native administration, you know, across the country could do more. The problem is we've... We've all got so tied up into the into the capitalist system of the United States that everything is measured in dollars and cents. Quality of life is being attributed to you know to the mean income, and and we've got to we've we've got to change that. We've got to change that lens. We've got to look at our lives differently than just you know than just dollars and cents. And I'm not just talking about here. I mean everywhere. And we also have to, you know, again, realize that what our relationships are from territory to territory. Look, there are some territories that are much more affluent than others. But how do we, I mean, when we start having our own biases and our own prejudices, 
because we look down at, at the poorer people who look a lot like us, who we are very much related to, but they don't have a casino or they don't have this or they don't have that. I mean, we have many territories that are relying heavily on extractive industries. Even as we're finding pipelines and coal burning plants and, and contamination, and environmental issues, make no mistake about it. There are a significant number of native territories who are intimately involved with the extractive industries, the, fo the burning of fossil fuels and the, and the marketing of fossil, fuel, uh, fossil fuels. So <clears throat> we've made some choices along the way that have not been uh, conducive to, to our best health, long-term or short-term. But again, what I come back to is if there's a, there's a few things that happen in our lifetime, and, th and this is an exceptional time. And I, I got to admit, <clears throat> I'm glad to be living today to witness what we're witnessing. Not because I like, <coughs> excuse me, not because I, I like to witness a, a horror story here. Because I see the opportunity in what comes from the, on the other side of this thing. So to live through this, this global pandemic and live through this time and realizing you know, if there's one thing that, that COVID-19 has demonstrated is the failure of U.S. capitalism, global capitalism for that matter. It's a failed system. And we, we see how it's, you know, how it's affecting. Look, we're, we're seeing the failure of governance. We're seeing the failure of, uh, of election systems. We're seeing the failure of, um, uh, you know, of, of financial institutions, the failure of, um, uh, of the, the global marketplace, the free market, as they call it. We're seeing all that stuff. And look, shutting down, allegedly, and they call it sh shutting down the economy for, for six weeks is not the collapse. We haven't even gotten to that place yet. We don't know what the long-term effects that, that the, the shutdown is going to have on the economy next year, for instance. This isn't just, you know, again, you hear the, all the politicians say, well, this isn't like turning on, a, uh, turning on and off a light switch. Unless you're Trump. Trump says, oh, no, we're going to turn the economy. It's going to come roaring back and it's going to be fine. Yeah, he's hoping that. He's hoping that, that, come, that he can say that in October and in November, you know, uh, win another four years as the president of the United States. But it's not that simple. It's not that simple. We, we're going to see some long-term effects. We're seeing the short-term effects. And, I, I'm not, and I'm hoping that we learn something from this. But if you think that this thing is just going to be over because, you know, the, the curve is starting to turn, and I'm not even sure, convinced that it's there. Keep in mind, there's still only been less than 2% of the U.S. population has been uh, tested. Most of the numbers that I throw around, you know, these you know, 3 million people infected in the world and, you know, um, uh, 200,000 dead in the world, you know, almost a million U.S. citizens uh, infected and, you know, 54,000 dead. Those numbers are still, by and large, being based on people who, who've been tested, which is only less than 2% of the U.S. population. So I think the numbers are still very, very troublesome because... Look, it, there, there are ways of doing test sampling, right? You can test a segment of population as long as the, it's a broad representation of the population. So it's, it's people with or without symptoms. It's people uh, of different ages, different genders, different ethnicities, different zip codes. <clears throat> and you can test that, whether it's an antibody test or whether it's you know, an, infectious, an infection test. <clears throat> and you can extrapolate those numbers. The problem is this isn't a broad sampling. of They're only testing people who are very, very sick. People who are going to hospitals because they need hospitalization. Well, that's not a broad sampling. I mean, it, it also doesn't, it, I mean, look, not everybody goes to the hospital when they're sick. People of color have a tendency not to necessarily go to, uh, to hospitals. People who are, are, are poor, who don't have health insurance, yeah, they don't go to the hospital as much as, as people with money. So you don't, if you're only basing all of these numbers, at least the numbers in the United States, on a failed health care system, you're not getting a, a, a numbers you could extrapolate across a, a, a whole broad population. So this less than 2% that have been tested, it doesn't, it, it is not a representative model of, 
of the U.S. population. And, you know, and, and from a Native standpoint, I think, look, I, last week when I heard um, uh, the president of the Senate Nation speak, I think only five people in Senate territory have been tested. Last week. I don't know how many have been now, but there was only five people in, in, in the entire Seneca Nation that had been tested. And, so, and when I look at these numbers in Navajo, in Navajo territory, and I see 1,500 people that are, that are uh, positive, I, it, it, you know, it begs the question, well, how many people have been tested? Is it really 1,500? Is it, are there really you know, a, a million people in the United States that, that are positive? Or is it really like 10 million? Or is it 20 million or 30 million? Uh, one of the antibody tests they did on California, um, they did a random sampling. They said the likelihood is the number of people infected are probably 30 times, 35 times higher than the numbers uh, that th those who have been tested uh, are indicating. So, look, if there's, if there's a million people in the United States that are, uh, that are positive or that have been positive, according to this study at Stanford University, it might be 35 million. It might be 35 times higher than that. Of course, they took those numbers and they said, which means the mortality rate's much lower. Well, the problem with that is I'm not sure all the deaths are being considered. So, you know, and, I, and I've covered some of this stuff before. So, but I, I just think it's really important that, that we concentrate on our health with or without COVID-19. Do everything we can to protect our most vulnerable people. But again, let's do everything we can to not contribute to more vulnerable people in our, in our communities. That's my message for the day. So I want to thank you for listening. And, uh, well, we'll be back here on Tuesday, and uh, we'll see what those numbers look like that day. I want to thanks for, thank you again for listening. This is John Kane. This is Let's Talk Native. Yahweh.